This is not just another book chat podcast. Lifelong reader Cindy Rollins joins teachers Angelina Stanford and Thomas Banks for an ongoing conversation about the skill and art of reading well. Explore the lost intellectual tradition and discover how to fully enter into the great works of literature. Learn what books mean while delighting in the sheer joy of imagination. Each week, we will rescue story from the ivory tower and bring it to your couch, your kitchen, and your commute. The literary life is for everyone, because in the words of Stratford Caldecott, to be enchanted by story is to be granted a deeper insight into reality. Join us for an ever unfolding discussion of how stories will save the world. This is the Literary Life Podcast. Welcome back to the Literary Life Podcast. I'm Angelina Stanford, and with me is, well, no Harlequin, although quite as mysterious as the Harlequin, I might say. Yes. Mr. Banks. Yeah, official straight man of the House of Humane Letters. Correct. Correct. Um, yes. I, For a long time, I, I uh, listeners of this podcast who's been following me for many years know my my romance journey where I said I was Harriet Vane um, looking for a Lord Peter. And I very much met, I found my Lord Peter, but then we had a good laugh about the fact that actually I'm Lord Peter and you're Harriet Vane. Yeah. I guess so. Well, I'm much more to it, like. That's a confusing sort dress of dress up in a costume yeah. and dive into a fountain, and uh, Harriet's the more calm one. That's true. I would never do that. I would never dress up as a clown if you, no matter how much you paid me. I would totally go in disguise mm-hmm. to break up a drug ring. I'm, I'm like living for this. Actually, I I've been to a couple of costume parties, and I, I thought you were going to say you've broken up a no, couple of drug rings. Well, no, I mean, no, not not that so much, but I. Uh, the costume parties I've gone to, I find that almost all costumes are uncomfortable. It doesn't really matter like what period we're talking about I can here. See that. That's the thing. Yeah, I just I just don't like that particular type of festivity. A couple of years ago, we did a a video podcast episode on Halloween, and I dressed up as Harriet Vane, and you were Lord Peter. I don't think I dressed up, did I? You, Cindy, sent us a monocle, and you wore the monocle. Oh, I wore a monocle. That <laughs> was your. You refused to dress up. It okay. was your one concession. That was my one concession. Yeah. Yes. I've forgotten that. So we are talking about Dorothy Sayers' Murder Must Advertise. We're continuing our series on that, and today we're going to cover chapters six through eleven, as well as a whole bunch of interesting stuff. sideways digressions on her admirers and also her haters, and she yes. had both. Yes, we will talk about that, and we'll talk about uh, more about the detective novel as a form. And its function and why certain people hate it. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're American, uh, like we are, it took me a long time when I was a kid to realize that when I was re- reading British books and they were talking about a fancy dress party, they didn't mean that like you were just wearing fancy clothes. That that's what British people call a costume party. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, before we jump in with all things Sayers, um, quick reminder of our upcoming How to Read a Symphony webinar. We're very excited about that. We talked about that last week. Um, Karita has been letting me know what's going on there, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be amazing. I'm 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 really really pleased about this, and excited to see about this relationship we have with her and what good stuff can come of it. So we need a resident music expert. We've been talking about that. Absolutely. I, I for a long time I thought this is a this is a need we have, um, a hole in our universal story approach. We needed to talk about uh, the story of music. Uh, so, yeah, if you if you caught last week's podcast, we, we talked about the webinar. I don't need to repeat all of that. But if you were thinking about signing up, do it. Go to our website, houseofhumaneletters.com. Click on the uh, webinars tab, and you'll find all the information you need for this upcoming webinar. Again, like everything we do, it's live or later. Uh, so you don't have to be there for the live class. Uh, you will you will own the video um, and uh, watch it as many times as you like. It'll be yours to keep. And I think it'll just really increase your understanding of what's going on in the world of classical music. And uh, maybe for some of us, it'll be a, a huge paradigm shift to realize that they, they tell stories too. All right. Well, um, before we get to the commonplace quotes, because I feel like I'm going to forget to do this, 
Um, I, if, if you've been following the podcast for a while, you know that I'm the great lover between the two of us, the great lover of detective novels. Uh, and, and you're kind of new to this genre and are you, are you enjoying this book? Yeah. I mean, I'm not an absolute babe in the woods, but yeah, I, um, I like this book very much. I mean, maybe this is a bad recommendation, but, um, the parts I find myself most drawn into are not necessarily the parts where the mystery itself is principally under discussion. So I enjoy, I mean, it's a time in history I find interesting. I think Great Britain in the interwar era, I've read a lot of books about both fa you know, nonfiction and fiction about this period. And um, yeah, um, I guess you could say the social atmosphere of the world she's describing is itself intoxicating enough to me that I enjoy the book for the, that and other reasons. And the dialogue also, I think that Dorothy Sayers is really a good dialogue writer and um I, I can kind of tell. For, I, I don't know her plays well, but she does write dialogue with some as someone who clearly has an ear for the stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you can see how the the playwright and the novelist complemented one one another in that. Um, as for the as for the mystery, I gave up any hope of uh, solving that after about three pages, and that's fine. Um, well, I don't think you have to apologize for that. Yeah. I think Dorothy Sayers would be happy with what you just said. And um, for me this is again different from my my approach to Agatha Christie but for me Sayers is never about it's never about the mystery it's always about the world building and the characters and everything else that's going on and and again in that quote that I read last week murder must advertise was the first time that she tried to deliberately write a novel of manners and so for you to say you like um the you know the scene that she's painted of Britain in the interwar period and the dialogue I think she would love that I think she would be very very highly complimented that this is what you're tracking and because it's not about the mystery for me it's why I can read these books over and over I mean I don't actually even remember there's more it. than one there's more than one uh there's more than a single stratum of excellence it's not all surface you know oh, definitely yeah. not Defi definitely not and at the same time she is definitely working within this genre so I'm, I'm glad I'm glad when I when I chose this book for the podcast, it was very deliberate because I chose it for you. And I told you at the time that I felt like this book was a good book for the both of us to read because it was like Agatha Christie meets Evelyn Waugh. No, it's it's good for me to read this book right now. Honestly, I've been in kind of a, a couple of weeks ago. I felt myself in kind of a reading slump. I, I realized that. Oh, I didn't know. That. Well, I had reread a couple of books that I had read five or six times before uh, just because I was sort of picking them up out of habit I'm and that kind of thing. I'm also in the midst of rereads. We're just we're trying well, I mean, to- I mean, rereading is right good. I mean, I think rereading is a, a good habit, but I, um, I sometimes I can reread something just because I'm comfortable with it and don't have to pay too much attention because I know what comes next. Mm. That'll happen to me occasionally. But no, so now that I, once I started reading this a couple weeks ago or whatever it was, um, yeah, I felt kind of- uh, yeah, some some zip and some some joy come back into it, and uh, I then I picked up a Kingsley Amos book, which I'm thoroughly enjoying, one I hadn't read before. And yes, life goes on, life goes on. So this was a this was just the tonic. Well, good. Well, we've talked about this before on the podcast that this is very much how detective novels function for me. I don't want to say that they're a palate cleanser, but they are comfort. They are comfort reads to me. And um, if if I'm in a situation where I'm going through a reading slump, which if you're listening, everybody goes through a reading slump. It's not just you. Like even Mr. Banks, who's the most disciplined reader I've ever met, goes through reading reading slumps. I mean, life gets hard. It gets busy. You kind of fall out of the habit. Other things take your attention. Um, and when I'm in that state where I, I, I like, come on, come on, you know, I, I need to get reading. Detective novels, they help me with that. I, I think because they're plot driven and, and they, I just sit and Of course, there's no audio book for this one. So I have been forced to sit, at least not in America. <clears throat> Come on, America, get with it. Like we have friendly relations with England. I don't understand why these audiobooks cannot cross the pond, but I digress. Um, but it's forced me to sit here with the physical book and slowly go through it page by page and take notes. Um, and that's good for me. And it's helping me to pick up other, other things as well. I found out that Dorothy Sears' first murder mystery actually appeared in America before it appeared in Britain. Is that right? She was able to find an American publisher before a British one. Yeah. Or I didn't remember that. Okay, I mean, I guess maybe because over here, her books might have kind of an exotic quality, whereas in Britain, she might at first glance seem like mm -hmm. just another 
from the Lord and a bunch of people in a country home where someone died. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not her, it's just, you it's said not, it's just not great. It's not great. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when I talk about how much I love these books and love her, uh, inevitably somebody will hear me and think, oh, I need to go start at the beginning and they'll read the first one and think, what is this woman talking about? But, mm -hmm. um, I would, I would definitely not judge all of them by, by the Shakespeare's, first. Shakespeare's first couple of plays also, like the Henry the Sixth parts one through three and, uh, the two gentlemen of Verona, Titus Andronicus, or like, you, you know, you have to learn your craft. You have to learn it doesn't matter craft. who you are. Exactly. And uh, I, I, it's interesting that she didn't think that this one was very good. So we talked yeah. about how she, she was, thought this was a pot boiler. Yeah, she was kind of stuck on the nine tailors and uh, she needed, you know, she had deadlines, she had bills to pay. Um, and uh, so she knew she could, because the nine tailors is just extremely well researched in campanology. And so she, she got kind of bogged down in that. And she knew that she could fire off a book about an ad agency yeah. <laughs> really quickly. Um, but she also was intentionally trying to do something else. But she she thought it failed. She thought it failed because, I think this is funny, she said, um, I know all about the ad world. I know nothing about the drug world. Mm -hmm. So she felt like that part. Surprise. Kinda, yeah, surprise. Yeah. That she, she felt like that part kind of fell apart. I, I don't think that that's correct. Um, I never thought that. I mean, I also don't know the drug world. So maybe, maybe I'm showing my own colors here. But... It's a good reminder, I think, that very often um, the writer is the worst judge of their own work. Oh, yeah. Because this is one of my favorites. I do not think it failed. She thinks I, it failed, but that Nine Tailors was her great success. Almost. I, of the writers I know best and who I've whose work I have read backwards and forwards, um, almost always in the cases where I know which favorite of their books, you know, they selected, it's kind of incoherent it's to me it's weird it's, it's just you, like that's what you think. here's here's my example evelyn waugh whom i really like and probably almost everyone who has read any number of his books will say that yeah his masterpiece is bride said revisited this is not really controversial he has other good books i think he has some you know handful of other almost great ones but his favorite was his one historical novel helena which is the one about the empress, uh, you know, the, the saint, the mother of Constantine, Constantine who mother. found the true cross. And that was the only one he would do public readings from. The others he thought were, you know, some of them are better than others, but this is my masterpiece. Okay, so that's it, yeah. so similar. Mark um, Twain thought that his Joan of Arc biography was his masterpiece. Which um, it's like, but it's the same sort of thing, like almost the like one book of his that isn't actually funny. Yeah, uh, it makes sense, right? I'm not saying they're correct, but I understand their their mental yeah. processes, right? Like, like and Dwayne worked really hard on that book yes, too. Diminishing um, the value of his comic work and yeah, that only serious spiritual work. That's that's what's that's what's serious. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like every really funny comedian when they want to be taken seriously in Hollywood, they do some dark movie, you know, like sure. it's got to be serious. Um, but you know, you have a similar thing too with a uh, Tolstoy who thought that Anna Karenina was a failure More and much peace. preferred, much preferred his heavily didactic spiritual work. resurrection. Yeah. The, the last mm -hmm. novel of his that nobody, nobody, nobody reads. reads. Yeah. yeah um, it's the same sort of thing. The, the famous 800 page sermon. Um, All right. it, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Well, shall we share some commonplace quotes? Yeah. Uh, for us. Well, okay, I kind of have two, one of which is very short, okay, let's one hear. of which, okay. So this is from a Kingsley Amos novel called That Uncertain Feeling, which is, um, it's kind of hard to describe. I'll just say my, my elevator pitch for this book, it's a satire on whales and all things Welsh from their language to yeah, their- what you were saying, it's a satire on Wales, W-H, I guess I like, this is a parody of Moby Dick, but no, the country Wales. Okay. The country <laughs> Wales, where Amos lived briefly as a young man and he, he didn't like it. Um, he even makes fun of Welsh stop signs, but that's a different story. So uh, he writes, vanity, if you train it with enough devotion, can be the best defense against boredom. Nice. I don't know if I actually agree with that, but it's phrased well. You do you do you are very attracted to a good turn of phrase. I am. Okay. And um, actually, you should go next because that this other commonplace, which is an attack on Dorothy Sayers, I'm going oh, no, to have no. yeah, to. I'm going to. I'm going to save that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably should save that. You can bring okay. that up. That bring that up later when we talk about her detractors. So I was trying to track down a commonplace quote, and I cannot remember what notebook I wrote it in. So I'm I'm going with my second choice, but. Um, what I'm about to read is is said, uh, Chesterton has essays where he says this, Dorothy Sayers talks about this. I was The quote I was trying to find, um, some of the, the, the great whimsy lovers out there are going to chapter and verse me on this, but I know it's in strong poison, 
because she introduces a character who is a female writer of detective novels. And it's very clearly, you know, it's Dorothy Sayers. Harriet Vane is Dorothy Sayers. And she's talking about writing a detective novel and how it's essentially a moral, it's a moral work. Um, and Chesterton also said that the detective novel is sort of the last great morality tale. Uh, and this is a quote in keeping with this. So if you listen to the episodes we did on Harry Potter, you heard me rave about J.K. Rowling's detective novel series, which, as an aside, is definitely not for everyone. It's a hard-boiled detective novel. Children shouldn't read it. Okay, so I've gotten all those disclaimers out the way. But I think that she is absolutely working in the tradition of the Golden Age detective novel. I put her right up there with the Queens of Crime. I, I think she is absolutely a queen. And this was a quote from one of her books, Lethal White. And it is talking about the role of the detective and um he's talking about how or he's thinking this i guess the narrator's writing but he's thinking about you know why do i do this why am i detective this is hard work this is thankless work this is dangerous work why do i do this so here's the quote he had had a choice after all the army had been keen to keep him even with half his leg missing Friends of friends had offered everything from management roles in the close protection industry to business partnership. But the itch to detect, solve, and reimpose order upon the moral universe could not be extinguished in him, and he doubted it ever would be. That's a good passage. Yeah. Oh, no. These, these, are, these are great. Um, and so this is the case that I, I, I hinted at last time. But over the next few episodes is the case I hope to make. Uh, when I talked about the incredible disorderedness of the world as a result of World War I, it'll get much worse when you get to World War II, you know, and, and that um, living in this disorder just created this, this nihilism, uh, this anxiety, this despair, really just this very intense kind of psychic despair, um, which people sought to alleviate in drugs and sex and spending of money and, you know, all of the things that we are still trying to do now to alleviate that despair. And, and I talked about last time about this is the rise of the crossword puzzle and the jigsaw puzzle and the detective novel. And I think they're all functioning the same way, just as this passage said, that the detective novel, like the jigsaw puzzle, is, is showing us that even in the ruins of the fragments, there is still order. We can reimpose the order. We can bring order back. And we talked about that quote last time from Dorothy Sayers, where she makes the connection between um, the detective and the knight on a quest. And it's the same sort of thing. You know, your detective is a knight on a quest. Yes, he's to catch the bad guy, of course. But more than that, to reimpose order. All right, so I'll be talking more about that as we go. All right, so let's jump in. Then we'll then we'll get back to your to your quote. Certainly, I, I have a few corrections from last time. I'm so glad we have listeners who will jump on this. I I misspoke when I said it was a Walter de la Mare poem. Emily corrected me, and it was actually an A. E. Houseman poem called Breeden Hill that was being quoted in the book. A. E. Houseman. I, I could mistake those two as well, actually. So that was yeah. my bad. That's my bad. not that's not a huge faux pas. Um, several people did point out, yes, there were Kipling references, and they were talking about what those were on um, Facebook. Of course, in the chapters we read, the being about the yellow ding dog or dung dog, or that was a Kipling reference. And then there was a an earlier one too. So that so there have been a few Rudyard Kipling references. Um, we talked about Pym's publicity, and you said, "Isn't that a Woodhouse character?" And mm. so someone reached out to me. I don't remember who it was. I think it was Ann Phillips. I will give Ann credit. Somebody else will be angrily messaging me. That was me. Somebody reached out to me and to remind me of which P.G. Woodhouse story it was. And as soon as I remembered, I started laughing. So Pym is the painter in America who paints that really, really ugly baby. Yes. And and so it, it can't. It doesn't get accepted as art, and the twist at the end is all he can do with it is use it as an advertising campaign. <laughs> so, doggone, Dorothy, you're so good. You're so good that she names the whole thing because, of course, it's about her own feeling like she sells out. You know, that, she doesn't really do art. She just does advertising. That type of joke seems to have appealed to a lot of people at this time because there's a Nancy Mitford book. It's one of her early comedies where um, there's this avant-garde... Scottish, I think he's like a nihilist sort of social realist writer. And he's written this, you know, kind of gritty confessional novel, but everyone finds it uproariously funny except him. 
and it's it's the publisher sells it as you know the uh, the, the rip roaring uh, farce of the season and all that kind of thing, and everyone takes him as a great light comic talent when he really wants to be the the voice of his generation and all that rubbish. <laughs> um, all right, something else from last week. We wondered out loud, where did the phrase "bright young things" come from? Oh yes, and one of our students who is honestly. Shout out to her. She is the queen of all things, Lord Peter Whimsey. Like, I think uh, the very first time I had her in middle school, her name on camera was Harriet Vane. And I thought, I don't know who this kid is, but I love her. Uh, and she, she's she's my whimsy girl. So shout out to Natalia Testa, our brilliant student who knows all things whimsy. She messaged me with the answer to the question, where did the phrase bright young, bright young things come from? And... She says the name, or she's quoting an article, actually, the name Bright Young People originally appeared as part of a Daily Mail headline on July 26, 1924. Gosh. Well, very well done. Natalia. Well done. And she included this story, which is quite hilarious. There was a 1927 cartoon in Punch magazine. Okay, so the Bright Young Things has become so well known in culture that they can now spoof it in a cartoon in a magazine, 1927. So this is how it goes. A middle-aged lady aggressively addresses a society gentleman. Are you one of the bright young people? I am. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Natalia. Well done. That was, that was really funny. Uh, all right. So Something else we wondered about was, or maybe I was the only one, I always joke in my classes about my ADHD brain and my hyper-focus, and I never know where I'm going to go. And then, you know, all of a sudden I'm an expert in, you know, serial killers of the 1930s. But my brain took me into wondering about drugs. What was the drug scene in the 1930s? So I did some research on this, and I ended up, of all places, on the NHS website, the Natural, National Health Services for England. And I found these scholarly research articles, one of which was called um, The History of Drugs in England from 1890 to 1930. And I read it. I read it. And I was riveted about the, the drugs. And I told you all about it. And you said you have to share this on the podcast. You know, <laughs> I was going to say, as the proverb has it, this actually isn't a proverb, but you can tell a lot about a person by what they do with their insomnia, Ms. Stanford. This was pressing. I needed to know. I didn't stop there, too. I kept reading about what happened after the 1930s. So I feel like I now understand the drug trade from the early 1800s to the present day. I don't know what I'm going to do. Take me to trivia night. I'll be ready. And this is one of the moments in the show when I really wish this were being filmed because your face right now is like this, this brilliant mad look on it. Yes. It's your favorite look that I do. And I, the brilliant mad look. Yes. Well, I mean, I just I like knowing things and I like understanding the world I live in. So here, here's my rough summary, my, my very quick summary on, on the drug trade, because I found this quite fascinating. In the 1800s, it's opium. We knew that, right? So laudanum, which was being prescribed, got a lot of people addicted. It was made of opium. You have opium dens. Um, this article pointed out, though, that mostly what you're seeing in the 1800s is drug use in literary circles. So like Lord Byron and those those groups. Um, and it's mostly uh, opium. Coleridge. Coleridge, yeah, opium. Almost a Quincy. Well, yeah. Yes. and Invented the drug memoir. That's right. Yeah. Opium, a little bit of hashish also. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty much the drugs that are that are happening there. Um, and they're trying to use it and in so many ways. They're like the 1960s. They're trying to transcend to a higher realm and all these things. Of course, they, they, get, they ended up getting addicted. But it's not something you're seeing in the general public. In fact, the article said, despite what you see in the Sherlock Holmes book of him having a cocaine habit, that's really not, that really wasn't the case. That, that you just, you didn't see that. The, um, uh, particularly in the um, lower classes, the working classes, it was gin. Gin was just destroying them uh, in its addictive properties. Oh yeah, there were much, many more laws and regulations against, you know, public houses and things like that. And you know, when you could have hours of operation and uh, then, then concern about Right. Cocaine. Right. Yeah. So alcohol, the much, much bigger, the much bigger. And of course, alcohol continues to go through the 20th century and the 21st century. I mean, alcohol is a steady. But um, so after World War One, I, I, I had to chuckle to myself after doing an entire podcast episode about how World War One changed everything to find out that World War One also changed the drug trade. Um, and so 
instead of it just being something you saw in kind of li literary bohemian circles, it starts to spread out in the 1920s and 1930s into the larger populace. Uh, at first, it's just spreading to more artsy bohemian people, and then it spreads to upper class bored people. So all these people who have ennui, like Diane de More, um, rich people who are bored with their meaningless lives and looking for a thrill are getting into drugs. It's not going to be until the 40s and 50s that it's going to start trickling down to the working classes, where, where of course, now it, it quite drugs and drugs like crystal meth you know just devastate working class towns uh it takes a while for it to trickle down so this kind of recreational drug use in the 1930s is limited another to example of poor people gradually acquiring the bad habits of rich people yeah totally right um so the type of drug also changes there i mean you know drug habits die hard so you there is still some occasional opium use but mostly the drug of choice at this time again a little bit of hashish but mostly cocaine so lots and lots of cocaine which um, they did mention in the story uh, they also talked a little bit about heroin heroin's not gonna become bigger until a little bit later um heroin will be a much bigger deal later on and then in the 1940s and 50s with the advent of world war ii um that's when you start seeing um, amphetamines, mm. pills, people popping pills for recreational drug use. That starts in the 40s and 50s. That, that has not stopped. Um, oxy and all the other things like that. And the like that. proliferation of morphine addiction, of course, is very mm -hmm. closely linked to the yep. wars um, yep. as a painkiller and all that. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I don't see, I, I didn't see a ton of recreational use of morphine, but people, people, you know, just like now you get prescription painkillers and you end up getting addicted on it. Yeah, that same sort of thing was happening. So it's quite interesting. What was also interesting to me was where the drug trade was coming from. So obviously China is where opium came from, um, which I thought about that when there's the chapter where Colonel Parker said, you know, I'm bored, nothing really happened today. And I, there wasn't even like a, a Chinaman for me to investigate. And I wanted to point out that that was not just like a random racist comment, but that China's where the drugs were coming from. But also, it's a there was also a um, tongue-in-cheek yeah. joke about the, um, the the rules of the detective club. One oh, of them, if you remember, yes. Oh, oh, yes, that's right. One of them, if you remember, was you can't you can't randomly introduce a sinister foreigner who's the guilty suspect. And I think she so, specifically and she said, says, kind of a, "Yes, right." No, you're right. right. You're right. That was one of the rules. The butler can't do it. There can't suddenly be a twin who appears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. She's playing with that too with the Harlequin, but um, but. The drug trade was coming out of Asia. So it would be very much like how, you know, <laughs> Ozark, the show Ozark, and you have your, you know, Central American drug lord. It's that kind of thing. But what surprised me, okay, so I knew, I knew opium came from China. What surprised me, though, is where cocaine from, came from. In the 1930s, the biggest producer of cocaine was Japan. No. Yeah. I had isn't, no isn't idea. surprising? Huh. Things your wife learns when she starts, you know searching on the nhs website <laughs> that's fascinating i never heard that before yeah no no of course it's gonna it's gonna change it's gonna change but it, it yeah it takes a long time before it's uh central america where all these things are coming from hmm. and i don't quite have all the details of uh of, of how that happened but uh so yeah so anyway this is this is the world of the bright young things with recreational drug use a lot of cocaine a lot of alcohol um and cocaine of course is highly addictive and um yeah. Uh, Natalia also pointed out to me, so shout out to her again, that this book of Sayers does have some similarities with the very first one she did, because in both of these, um, Whimsy and Detective Parker are on two different cases. And they start- That are going to become converge be and beginning. become one case. Yeah. yeah. No, she does that very well in this. Um, yeah, she can handle multiple plot threads. I was trying to think of any other murder mystery writer. And of course, I do not have the frame of reference that you do here. But can you think of any other murder mystery where there are two seemingly unconnected investigation, unconnected investigations or two murders or something that don't seem to have anything to do with each other? But obviously, but at, at, you know, at some point. Not off the top of converge. my head. Like I can't. None of the Does larger... ABC murders go that way? Or is that yes? Is is it no, apparent? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. ABC Murders does have a little bit of that, but like where where one thing sort of becomes a red, but it's a red herring. They're yeah. not really related. Mm -hmm. like, so it's a you think something's going on, it's really something else. So it's not exactly the same. Okay. 
thing. That was the only one that I could think that even remotely. Marjorie Allingham is the other one who tends to get into like the criminal underworld like Yeah. this one does. Uh, several of hers do that, but I can't. Not off the top of my head. Hmm. Um, so she might not be unique in this, but I just don't recall off the top of my head. Okay. Where Cindy, when we need her, she would she would know it. Yeah. She would know We, it. we might have to have Natalia on as a guest, you know, a guest expert here. That's right. The literary life of Lord Peter Whimsey. We'll Mm-hmm. just have her come on and, and talk about all the things. She's probably shrieking right now in, into her telephone as she No, I mean, she, listens she taught to me the... something here. I mean, I had no idea about the bright young things. No, that's fantastic. No, she's a great student. Um, All right. Enough of the Natalia Praise show. We don't want all this going to her head. Go study, Natalia. <laughs> All right, I do want to talk about these chapters, and there's lots to talk about as we get deeper into the world of advertising and we get deeper into the world of this drug drug life um, and these characters. Uh, I thought this was an interesting quote from Sayers about Murder Must Advertise. Um, and I confess... that uh, this wasn't my finest moment because I've read this book so many times and it was only when I read her say this that I thought, oh, duh, that is, that is what's happening. <laughs> I, I share my shame with you so that you can know I don't always notice everything. It's not, it's not true. Um, so anyway, she's talking about uh, Murder Must Advertise. And here's what she says. Um, well, she's talking about that she doesn't think the book is quite successful, but it's the second part of the sentence that I think is interesting. It was not quite successful. The idea of symbolically opposing two cardboard worlds, that of the advertiser and the drug taker, was all right. And it was suitable that Peter, who stands for reality, should never appear in either except disguised. No, that's wonderful. Yeah, Yeah. I hadn't picked that. That's so good. I do want to talk about the two cardboard worlds, though, because I was really paying attention to that. On, on on this reader. And of course he he is in disguise. And I mentioned last time she he's there's a sense in which he's always in disguise because he's always Playboy Lord Peter Whimsy, frivolous guy um, as a disguise. But the real Peter does break through from time to time. But the alternating scenes between the advertising world and the drug world, and that they're both well, it just really struck me how much they're both dream worlds. They're It, both illusory worlds. I think especially in the um, fashionable, uh, you know, young person crowd, the bright young thing said with Dion de Dion de Mummery. De Mummery. Yeah. De Moray. She's not Rebecca De Moray, sorry. Diane De Mummery. Yes. Uh, the, everything there, the whole atmosphere is kind of one of delirium where, you know, we're moving as fast as we can, having as much fun as we can, crashing as many gates as we can. And even the scene where there's a this kind of half-drunk car race going on, that is a tip of the hat, as I mentioned to you, to Yves Lenoir's novel about the bright young things, vile bodies, where there is also a, there's a famous scene where these young people are, you know, kind of, I, I think they might, I think alcohol or drugs might be involved. And they're in a, uh, a sort of steeplechase kind of thing. And uh, one of them is killed driving a car too fast. And it's, it's described almost entirely like this. Yeah, that was fascinating to me when you mentioned that. Uh, it made me start thinking of all of the books and movies where youth culture, drugs and alcohol, and dangerous things with cars are all connected. I mean, not to be too silly, but I mean, there's a huge scene like that in the movie Footloose. Yes, I've forgotten that, yeah. Yeah, so so yeah, so Evelyn Wall puts those together. That's very interesting. And that, yeah, that was a tip of the hat to that. And we also discuss how that one little line where um, Deanne remarks um, how tired making or how yawn Quite making, making. how yawn making, that little odd bit of slang. So there's a character in Vile Bodies who always talks like that. So like when she's when she said something foolish and put her foot in her mouth, she says uh, how shy making or how shame making. And it's this weird combination of slang and almost baby talk. And I think I think Dorothy Sayers is, yes, offering a bit of homage to Waugh here. You know, in a lot of 1930s screwball comedies, there's a lot of baby talking by the main female lead. Now that you mention it, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been part of the whole, like, feminine thing. So you either a femme fatale or a baby talker or a combination of those. Mm. One thing that also struck me um, 
was if you look at the chapter titles, they all read like ad slogans. I hadn't noticed that till you pointed it out. But it's so funny, right? The singular spotlessness of a lethal weapon is the chapter title for number six. And I thought, man, she's got a lot of alliteration here. So I flipped back to the table of contents and then laughed as I saw that it's all, all the chapter titles have alliteration. They're all ad names. The only way to make that, to underline that even more is to put an exclamation point at the end of each chapter title. <laughs> but that would be just a little bit too cheesy. Yeah. Now with bonus whiter features or, you know, whatever. Your your whites will be extra white with a new tide. Um, yeah. So I think I think the parallel between the advertising world and the drug world is so spot on, right? So you said about, you know, you're out there, you're racing and, and you're trying, basically trying to feel something, right? And so your, your life is meaningless and you're taking these drugs and you're also escaping reality and living in a, an illusion. Let me purchase distraction. Right. In a way that might be detrimental to myself. But right. And so she shows that the advertising world is also a drug, right? And and people are buying an illusion and they think it's going to make them feel better mm -hmm. to buy something. That is a profound insight. And it just strikes me again because um, Brave New World was written in the 1930s. That this is essentially what Aldous Huxley is saying, too, that you're in a dream world. Um and so the Alice in Wonderland reference that I referenced last week made me think about, okay, so if 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 this is an Alice in Wonderland, then he must be descending into a dream world. So I want to I pick up that idea through these chapters that the world of advertising and the world of the drugs is all an illusion. We were going to read the opening of chapter 11, I believe. Well, I, where it, I wasn't there yet. I thought you we weren't get there, there yet. But okay. But now you mentioned. All right. All right. We'll flip for that. Let's, let's, read, let's read the opening of chapter 11 because I think she really – Makes all that, that I was suspecting. She makes it very explicit. Hold on, let me find. So this is the inexcusable invasion of a ducal entertainment. Uh, shall I? Yes, go ahead. To Lord Peter Whimsey, the few weeks of his life spent in unraveling the problem of the Iron Staircase possessed an odd dreamlike quality, noticeable at the time and still more insistent in retrospect. The very work that engaged him, or rather the shadowy simulacrum of himself that signed itself on every morning in the name of Death Breeden. Excuse me, Death Breeden. Well, no, but he says late it's going to be death like breath. He says that at some point, but go ahead. Whatever it is. <laughs> wafted him into a sphere of dim platonic archetypes, bearing a scarcely recognizable relationship to anything in the living world. Here those strange entities, the thrifty housewife, the man of discrimination, the keen buyer and the good judge, forever young, forever handsome, forever virtuous, economical and inquisitive, moved to and fro upon the complicated orbits, comparing prices and values, making tests of purity, asking indiscreet questions about each other's ailments, household expenses, bed springs, shaving cream, diet, laundry work, and boots perpetually spending to save and saving to uh, ban and saving to spend cutting out coupons and collecting cartons surprising husbands with margarine and wives with pa with patent washers and vacuum cleaners occupied from morning to night in washing cooking dusting filing saving their children from germs their complexions from wind and weather their teeth from decay and their stomachs from indigestion and yet adding so many hours to the day by labor-saving appliances that they had always leisure for visiting the talkies, sprawling on the beach to picnic upon potted meats and tinned fruit. And when adorned by so-and-so silks, blanks, gloves, dashes, footwear, whatnots, weatherproofs, complexion cream, and thing gummies, beautifying shampoos, even attending Ranelagh, Cows, the Grandstand at Ascot, Monte Carlo, and the Queen's drawing rooms... Where, Breeden asked himself, did the money come from that was to be spent so variously and so lavishly? If this hell's dance of spending and saving were to stop for a moment, what would happen? If all the advertising in the world were to shut down tomorrow, would people still go on buying more soap, eating more apples, giving their children more vitamins, roughage, milk, olive oil, scooters, and laxatives, learning more languages by gramophone, hearing more virtuosos by radio, redecorating their houses, refreshing themselves with more non-alcoholic thirst quenchers, cooking more new appetizing dishes, affording themselves that little extra touch which means so much. Of uh, Or would the 
whole desperate whirly gig slow down and the exhausted pub exhausted public relapse upon plain grub and elbow grease. He did not know. Like all rich men, he had never before paid any attention to advertisements. He had never realized the enormous commercial importance of the comparatively poor. Not on the wealthy, who buy only what they want when they want it, was the vast superstructure of industry founded and built up, but on those who, aching for a luxury beyond their reach and for a, le a leisure forever denied them, could be bullied or wheedled into spending their few hardly won shillings on whatever might give them, if only for a moment, a leisured and luxurious illusion. Phantasmagoria, a city of dreadful day, of crude shapes and colors piled babel-like in a heaven of harsh cobalt and rocking over a void of bankruptcy. Cloud cuckoo land, peopled by pitiful ghosts from the thrifty housewife providing a grand family meal for fourpence with the aid of Dairyfield's butter beans and margarine to the typist capturing the affections of Prince Charming by a liberal use of Muggins Magnolia face cream. Okay, that paragraph... That was the best piece is, of writing in the whole book so far. Yes! That's, I, that was brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant writing. By the way, I've I have read two reviews of contemporary reviews of her work from the 1930s which both highlight and emphasize quite quite angrily that she can't write well we'll get to we'll get to her detractors in just uh -huh. a minute there's too much here i want to talk about um so she's explicitly stating that this is an illusory world this is an illusion oh and um, the, a couple of those expressions uh cloud cuckoo land by the way is an allusion to um aristophanes the greek comic playwright um he wrote a play called the birds which is set in the fantastical sort of place in Never Never Land, Cloud Cuckoo Land. So that's where that phrase comes from. Not only does she emphasize that this is a world of an illusion, to me, this is almost, this is Dante-esque. When you say, I mean, she does she does later translate Dante, but she knows her She Dante. does describe it as a hell. It's a hell. She specifically says it's a hell. And so, so this modern world of buying and saving is a, it's a hell, and it's and it's a it's almost like Sisyphus. It's a loop, right? Like you're you're saving to spend, and you're spending to save, and you're you're just caught up in this cycle of insanity, and it's a hell, and you can't break out of it. And so it's it, it it's like the drug induced. It's an infernal machine. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, it's like a drug induced hallucination. You're, but we're all in it, all of us in it, and then. Just a few lines down, you know, Peter's talking about this. And um, among these phantoms, Death Breeden driving his pen across reams of office fool's cap was a phantasm too, emerging from this nightmare toil to a still more fantastical existence among people whose aspirations, rivalries, and modes of thought were alien and earnest beyond anything in his waking experience. Nor when the Greenwich-driven clocks had jerked on to half past five had he any world of reality to which to return. For then the illusionary Mr. Breeden dislimmed and became the still more illusionary Harlequin of a dope addict's dream, an advertising figure more crude and fanciful than any that postured in the columns of the Morning Star, a thing bodiless and absurd, a mouthpiece of stale cliches shouting in dull ears without a brain. From this abominable impersonation he could not now free himself, since at the sound of his name or the sight of his unmasked face, all the doors in that other dream city, the city of dreadful night, would be close to him. This is so good. So the city of dreadful night is a poem by James Thompson. Uh, it's a uh, what eighteen sixties uh, mid Victorian poem, which is a kind of dreamlike hellscape that he describes. Oh, yeah, she knows all the books. She knows all the books. She knows all the books. Um, so he's caught up in this illusion, and and again, she's making this connection that advertising. And the illusion in that world, it's a nightmare world. So I want to, I want to build on this just, for, just for a little bit. And then we can, we can turn to the things you want to talk about. But so I talked about last time how there's that Alice in Wonderland language and that that's descent language. And so like, it's like, he's going down into some kind of hell. And then of course he, he does, he goes into that, to that hell world. Um, but the, the descent into hell is also a descent into a dream world. So it can also function that way. Sometimes it can be both uh, as it is here. And the reason that we think of that as a descent is because you fall asleep, right? And you wake up. So the the going to sleep as a descent into the illusion, which could be a nightmare, in this case is a nightmare, 
all of those things are connected. So I started thinking about that more and more and how everybody in that drug world keeps falling asleep. Did you notice that? Diane falls asleep. He has to carry her home. The guy in the mm-hmm. car is falling asleep. Everybody's falling asleep. So the nightmare world they're in, the illusion they're in, the hellscape they're in is all connected to falling asleep. So in terms of images, that is a picture of how, and, I, and I just, again, she's connecting this to the ad world too. So we're all in this nightmare. We have all fallen asleep in this nightmare and we need to wake up from it, right? But, but he can't. So here's where it gets interesting about the Harlequin. So you mentioned that the Harlequin is a stock figure in the Commedia dell'arte and that he's often the helpful servant who figures things out. But I went and looked up what Northrop Fry said about the Harlequin because I remembered that he connected it to descent imagery, okay? So part of... I'm giving like the miniature version here for people who really want to nerd out on this. But but part of the imagery in Descent is very, very often when you descend down into that dream world, you will encounter your double. So a doppelganger or an evil twin, something like that. And then you, you symbolically, you have to go through sort of separating yourself from your double and then the double will stay down and then you will ascend and it'll be your real self. Okay. So the fact that Lord Peter is in disguise and so there's there there are doubles. And, then, and by the end of this section of chapters, there's triples, right? So he's been split in two. He's pretending. Now, usually this literally happens in, in a story where you're, you, you're confronted with an actual doppelganger. But here, he's pretending to be his own doppelganger, right? Oh, that's my cousin. He looks just like me. He keeps pretending to be me. But it's it, but it's all fake. I right? like that bit. That was, yeah. No, that was fantastic. That was okay. Beautiful. And so he's he's pretending to be Breeden, so that's already the double, and then, but he's also the Harlequin. So here's what Northrop Fry says about the function of the Harlequin. And so I thought that this was really cool, what she's doing here, because again, we want to point out, Dorothy Sayers is a medievalist. She knows this stuff really, really well. If you don't know that she knows it, go read her introduction to Dante. Like, she will rock your world. The best part about her whole translation of Dante is the notes. I mean, this woman gets it. She understands the Dante stuff. Um, I marked something in the book about that. We'll have to look for that. But okay, so here he's talking about uh, in the descent, what happens with these doubles. And he starts talking about the Harlequin. He says, Shakespeare, like many other writers of comedy, often comes close to the Commedia dell'arte convention at the center of which is Harlequin. Of the various things Harlequin does, one is to divide himself into two people and hold dialogues with himself. Oh, that's very well done. Right? And look what I wrote in the margin. Isn't I wrote Lord Peter in Murder Must Advertise. Um, because that is exactly what she's doing. I was thinking in comic operas, um, Figaro is a Harlequin figure. And Figaro often holds conversations with himself. And in, in, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to say, Another modulation of the twin theme, which also suggests a dreamer and the self he is dreaming about. And I think she's she's doing both of those in here, isn't she? Mm-hmm, I think so. I love her. I love detective novels. You know who did not imagery. love her? Okay, yes. let's go. Okay, so I've been, chomping at the no, bit. So I, okay, talk I, to us uh, about people who did not like Dorothy Sayers. Speaking of descents, I had a descent down the rabbit hole of, I, I began with just Google searching Dorothy Sayers' bad reviews. And a couple names kept coming up, so I refined my search. So Dorothy Sayers, so her haters, she had two very, I mean, and these were critics of a certain weight and influence in the 1930s and 40s. Um, Queenie Levis in Great Britain, and on our side of the pond, Edmund uh, Wilson, known to his friends as Bunny Wilson. Who um, famously wrote, just so our listeners know that he's no friend of the detective novel, no, he, he, he famously wrote an yeah. essay called who cares who killed Roger Ackroyd? Yeah, he had a universal hatred of the genre. And he said that aside from a boyish fascination with Sherlock Holmes, he's never he had never read a single mystery, British, American, French, whatever, of any sort that impressed him even remotely. And he said that I had I got all this, you know, reader mail saying that uh, Dorothy Sayers is the is the gold standard, the Greenwich, you know, Greenwich Central Time by which the genre is to be judged. So he picked up the nine tailors. And he reviews this book while admitting that he actually didn't read it very attentively. (laughs) Why would you need to bother reading what you're reviewing? uh, Miss Dorothy Sayers was pressed upon me by 18 people, and the book of hers that eight of them were sure I could not fail to enjoy was a story called The Nine Tailors. 
Well, I set out to read the Nine Tailors in the hope of tasting some novel excitement, and I declare that it seems to me one of the dullest books I have ever encountered in any field. The first part of it is all about bell ringing as it is practiced in English churches and contains a kind of information of the kind that you might find in an encyclopedia article on campanology. I scooped I skipped a good deal of this and found myself skipping also large sections of conversation between conventional English characters. And um, then he brings up Lord Peter. He says he does not find Lord Peter at all winsome. He finds him just obnoxious. He doesn't like the fact that Dorothy Sayers makes a duke, you know, a nobleman, her hero. And uh, just everything about this this book is cliched in its Englishness. And uh, I, I think his, I, I think he objects to the Englishness of her world. Um, as much as as much as any of the any of the particular points of the genre, which she, yeah. Well, he definitely anyway. hates the detective novel. Oh yeah, very and, much. And so, Ed, Edwin Wilson is part of a series of critics at that time who are very much uh, fancy themselves tastemakers. Mm -hmm. They're the very hoity-toity illiterati. Oh, I actually that was a faux pas a Freudian slip. I call them the illiterati instead of the literati, but I'm going to stick with that hashtag trademarked. Uh, the illiterati. Uh, and and a lot of what they do is just bash people, say you're in and you're out. And, uh, you know, these are beneath me. And it, it's so reminiscent of what we read on the Harry Potter episodes when we read Harold Bloom's very, very negative review of Harry Potter, in, in which he also said he didn't read the books. Um, and, and that absolutely captures that type of critic who still very much exists, who doesn't even bother reading the books and spends all his time thinking in terms of who's in and who's out. And uh, if you're trying to be the hoity-toity high priest of literature, then stuff that's popular novels, whether they're the fantasy, the sci-fi, or the detective novel, popular novels are just going to be beneath your notice. So that was Edmund Wilson. And I'm going to go full ad hominem here. Edmund Wilson also, um, kind of a disaster of a life. Uh, this is a man with, I think, four wives, four failed marriages, I think about a dozen mistresses, a long, long-time alcoholic who also cheated on his income taxes and uh, was eventually apprehended by the IRS. But anyway, having shamelessly done the ad hominem thing now, on the other side of the pond, uh, we find Queenie Levis, who in 1937, in a magazine called Scrutiny, which is the kind of magazine that this sort of person deserves to write in, uh, wrote an essay called The Case of Miss Dorothy Sayers, where she she attacks Dorothy Sayers for having undeveloped literary tastes, um, for parading her sort of half-digested knowledge of, again, things like bell ringing and uh, medievalism. And she also says that Dorothy – she she basically accuses her of being a vulgarian with – It's crazy because Queenie Levis loved D.H. Lawrence. Which is true. Yeah, I mean, I guess D.H. Lawrence is fine, but – uh, Dorothy Sayers is not, but no, she she writes this about her objection to Dorothy Sayers' sense of humor, which she found, yeah, uh, just indecent. She says, quote, deliberate indecency is not shocking or amusing. It is odious merely as so much restoration comedy is. Okay, so like so Edmund Dorothy Sayers was Bonnie not, Wilson. Yeah. Oh, oh, please finish. No, I was going to say Dorothy Sayers, I guess, is just, just not chaste enough for the for the standards of Miss I love how you came to me and asked me like, what, so what are the, what are the, what are the, you didn't say raunchy, but you're like, what, what are the uh, indecent stuff that Dorothy Sayers writes? And I held up the book we're reading right now. And I said, this is the most, this, this the closest this to a salacious book. Closest that she wrote. to yeah. anything. And, and she even, I mean, you know, then you love the scenes where people are cursing and she just puts in parentheses expletive. You know, like the, yeah. the, these books yeah. are not, the, mm -hmm. she doesn't write anything salacious. That's ridiculous. Um, but to give some context on Queenie Levis, Queenie Levis is married to, or was married to, they're all dead. Thank goodness. Um, was married to F.R. Levis, the man for whom C.S. Lewis wrote the book, Experiment and Criticism. He wrote that entire book to oppose F.R. Levis, who he got accused of being a Puritan. So it makes sense that his wife is like this. And the two of them, uh, ran Cambridge almost like a cult. Their followers were called the Levisites. And like Edmund Wilson on the other side of the pond, Levis, um, again, Lewis, Lewis calls him out on this uh, in Experiment and Criticism, but very much fancies himself a high priest of literature who's in, who's out, and genre fiction would be absolutely out because you know they are 
when Lewis even says he thinks he's a high priest. I call him instead of Fr Levis. I call him Father Levis because he really does think. Yes, he thinks. Well, he's no, no, the it's, priest. it's like and, and he, so, he was but, a literary critic because by simply because of historical circumstances which determined he was born in 20th century England rather than living in 15th century Spain where he could have been a grand inquisitor. He could have yeah. met some people at the stage. And he would have liked to probably. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, so Stephen Fry, the comedian, he he went to Cambridge at sort of the tail end of their reign. And in his biography, he, he talks about the Levisites and how loathsome they are and calls Queenie Levis his harpy harridan of a wife. Um, yeah, who, which that all tracks with what C.S. Lewis said. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it wasn't just that. I mean, it, it's not just a case of them writing mean reviews of people's books. I mean, every critic probably will do that from time to time, but they would try to like take digs at people's careers and go after them on a professional level. And um, yeah, the Levises were just really an odious couple. It's probably not good for. Maybe it's just not good for a marriage that you should have two literary critics married to each other. What Maybe are, like one of you. And look at me. What are, we, what are you saying? No, like neither of us is a professional literary okay, critic. This is true. Phew, okay. Yeah. Saved, no, we're, we're a couple of English teachers who podcast a bit. I mean, okay, this is, okay, yeah. You're right, you're right. You're right. And we're not tastemakers. No, nobody cares what we think about taste, good or bad. You know. Nor should they. Uh, I mean, and, you know, the point is. You can dislike detective novels. You don't have to like them as a genre. But mm -hmm. but for Queenie to accuse Dorothy Sayers of having a half-baked understanding of campanology or the Middle Ages is beyond absurd. This woman is an insanely brilliant scholar of all things medieval. And I'm sure if she went nose to nose with Queenie Levis, uh, Queenie would definitely lose. Um, but but that's just the kind of like offhanded pot shot that doesn't have any any basis. I mean, you can say that well, I mean, it, it all comes down to, I think, that anytime something's really, really popular, there's always going to be that certain person who thinks, well, it can't be good if it's popular. It must be frivolous. That that was a that yeah. was a damning word with mm -hmm. the Levises. This is this is essentially just well, entertainment. Well, that's right. And, and mere entertainment. Mere entertainment. And yeah. that's what Lewis talks about, this I this this idea that Levis was proponent of, that um all art had to be serious. And he gives the example of Levis's students, he said, it would come as a complete shock to them that you're supposed to laugh at the Canterbury Tales. You know, there you go. Yeah, they, they don't have a, everything's got to be highbrow and serious. Um, and I guess they don't think the detective novel is serious. Um, I'm fairly certain that none of Queenie Levis's books are still in print. But so there you go. Yeah. Dorothy Sayers has one, right? Time has has uh, given its verdict. So another person, and and I and this came to my mind when we when we read this paragraph uh, that I, again I think it's extraordinarily fine writing. I think it's some of the best writing in any detective novel that you'll you'll ever read. And um, to me, again, just it just feels like something you'd read in even one well novel. Um, and I do think that she succeeded in elevating the form. But I thought about something you told me a while back um, that George Orwell also did not like for different reasons, but he huh. also did not like these books. Why? He thought there was, he thought that she had created Lord Peter with a lot of false, um, fake sparkle around him, and that she, she was uh, too fascinated with her hero and the world he was born into, the the world of. The moneyed Money. aristocracy and yeah. yeah. Well, of course, Orwell would have a problem with that because he's a socialist. And so he he, yeah. he thinks she's pushing out some kind of, you know, romantic that view he, of Because he has blue blood, he's noble and all that kind right, of exactly. crap. Um, you know, I feel like this book completely takes the teeth out of that argument. That passage alone, I that think. Passage like, alone, yeah. That passage mm -hmm. that, alone that that the world would stop if the, without the working classes. Mm -hmm. um, and that... And, and actually, if you pay attention, George, Lord Peter has that kind of view about himself as a second son that he has no purpose in life. That's the reason why he's detected. He has no purpose in life. Um, and for his, for like, yes, he's being kind of silly and tongue in cheek, but there's a lot of truth behind him telling Mary, his sister Mary, in those early chapters that he he finally earned a day's wages. Mm hmm. And, and, you know, that feels good. And then she kind of teases him. It's about time you get out there and learn some stuff. And then, of course, his sister Mary gives up her title and marries a non-noble person, um, the Detective Parker. And, you know, that, that, just, that makes me mad. George Orwell, I love you in so many ways. But boy, when he blows it, he really blows it. Occasionally, yes. Yeah, there's there's some other things. Um, 
that I've read that I like a lot of his literary criticism, but sometimes I'm just like, okay, no, you, 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 you missed, you missed it a big time on that one. Um, I, so I want to talk a little bit more about the chapter. So things are moving along with the, um, with the, with the, with the, sorry, with the murder, with the investigation. And Peter is now convinced it that a murder has been committed. Uh, and, and he gets himself just an adorable little Watson. I loved this. And I, and I love that the boy is reading detective novels uh, and, and is taking this extremely seriously. And I, so I started thinking about the idea of- Do you recognize the author that- No. He, the Quentin- Is it real? It, it's a name I'd heard before, but I, I thought you would know it. I don't. Qu Quentin something or other. Quentin- Sounds like a, um, a Penny Dreadful kind of book. Yeah, kind of did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't know those- um, they might be a little earlier. I should have I should have looked that I up. Natalia will message me afterwards and say these are the books. I, I learned from this also that in uh, on the other side of the pond they call uh, a slingshot a catapult. Yes, yes, a catapult. Um, so I started thinking about Dorothy Sayers' point, which is completely correct. Arthur Fry makes the same point that the detective is a knight mm -hmm. on a quest, and um, usually he has Bunter, and you know Sherlock Holmes has Watson. Everybody's got their got their you know. Um, Hercule Poirot has a Captain Hastings. You know, everybody's got their sidekick. And Bunter's not in this book. Normally it's Bunter who would come in with the um with the uh um fingerprint kit and mm -hmm. take pictures. And uh, you know, Bunter's kind of the CSI guy. He always comes in and examines the evidence for Peter. Um, but but he reaches out to the little boy, and it struck me that that he's in the role of the squire. Yes, I noticed that too. You did notice yes. that? Mm -hmm. And he's taking it very seriously. And you can see how there's a code of honor. Because he wants to be a detective himself. He wants to be a detective. So kind he's of the gonna, knight in training. Yes, exactly. And, and you see how seriously he takes it, how there's a code of honor. Um, and, and that he, so he is, you know, he's writing his, I love that scene so much where he's writing up his report for uh, Lord Peter and and he's fighting with his brother. He's willing to take a beating rather than let them see this case file. Um, and so, yeah, you, you see that, that, that there is a, a chivalry here. There's a code of honor. Um, I, I loved that. I love the idea of him as the, as the squire. Yeah. That, uh, that scene between the two of them was very well done. Um, there was also a couple of other interesting nods at the beginning of chapter six, um, when they're talking about Breeden's just in his office doing crossword puzzles. Okay. That was funny because Dorothy Sayers has a, she has a short story where the whole way Lord Peter figures out the crime is that it's all like a life-size crossword puzzle that they've been walking through in this house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the fact that he's in there doing crossword puzzles and he's the detective and they're being like, he's just frivolous. He's doing nothing. He's just doing crossword puzzles. Yeah. Well, that's how he's going to solve the case because he's the puzzle solver. He's kind of one of the, uh, there's the, um, the Latin proverb, uh, never less alone than when alone. Cause his mind is, always right. busy but he's it's kind of like i don't know kind of like a duck in a way it seems very you know still almost like it's not doing anything on the surface but it's very busy underneath you also told me that you thought you were surprised how funny this book is oh yeah yeah i mean it could uh i mean you you could even if you took the the whole mystery out of it you could make a screwball comedy almost yeah. a howard fox type right, okay. like his girl friday kind of yeah about the newspaper calling to say we can't run this ad Yes, because Which, it's not, it's just too suggestive. Too suggestive or, yeah. because they hadn't paid attention that what would happen when they put the headline with the picture and then she doesn't tell us what the picture is. And so, of course, our imaginations are wondering and then you find out what it is and it's a man and a woman and the headlines, you know, you're too hard at work. Um, you know? <laughs> and and just that whole scene is so great, but all the, the whole Mr. Copley moment was so brilliantly done and I loved this, Okay. Uh, if there was one action more than another, which Mr. Copley condemned as thoughtless and unfair, all caps, long advertising practice had given him a trick of thinking in capital letters. That was hilarious to me. Just utterly hilarious. That's a good line. The, 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 you can see how his, his mind is being framed uh, in that kind of uh, advertising. Okay, speaking of Mr. Copley, the, the whole business about the 50 pounds left by his colleague, Mr. Mr. Tallboy, and the whole ruckus over that, I know that's important. It's not clear to me why. Well, I guess you're going to have to keep Okay, reading. well, all right. Well, we know, come on, that's how detective novels work. Everybody's going to have something suspicious about them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to have to sort your way through what's actually a clue and what's not. And, you know, uh, the whole thing about detective novels is everybody's lying. Mm -hmm. but, um, not everybody's lying for the reason that they're covering up a crime. Of course. 
you know, and so there's like, you know, in a classic detective story, you know, somebody, somebody who you're, who's very suspicious and is clearly lying about his alibi. Well, it's because he's cheating on his wife and, yeah. but he didn't really commit the crime, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, everyone but, will have their dirty secret. Exactly. That... But, but, but you'll see the overall shape of the story is everything in the dark comes to light. All, you know, truth will out. Um, the detective novel is going to see and understand everything and write it. Um, but that, I have lots more to say about that, but I don't want to do it until we get a little further uh, toward the end to see what that looks like. I, I like how, I mean, the, the danger in this book is real. I mean, a murder really has been committed. Someone is out there who might be willing to commit another. But it, even when, even in moments of crisis, like the the tone of comedy is still kind of sustained. Like when Inspector Parker is attacked in the dark in the st of the stairwell by the, you know, unseen figure who roughs him up pretty good. Mm -hmm. And he, he, it says that he dodges the the spanner or whatever the guy's hitting with, and it misses his head and cracks his collarbone. And then he, he says, as that happened, as he felt his collarbone shatter, he thought that his hat would have stopped, warded the blow off his skull. And uh, anyway, it, it was a little bit off. funny, I thought, that that scene. And yet, um, that's true. I, yeah. I don't think that any of the Lord Peter novels are like, they're not thrillers. Right, it, it never is really dark. That's right. Yeah, it's never um, going to be really dark. Golden Age detective novels don't work like that. Even when there are scenes in which the detective novel might be in danger, mm -hmm. the, the main detective, I mean, um, it's not like it's not like a modern day thriller where like you're yeah. scared and your pulse is running. That that's not the world of the Golden Age detective novel, which is much more cerebral. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's writing the world here. It's it's actually kind of rare that you see a detective going undercover like you mm -hmm. like you have here she's she's definitely doing something different here um but uh yeah i love it i love it um one other thing that i did want to point out is where this book falls in the lord peter canon so this is after strong poison and after um unnatural death which are two books with harriet vane and she's not in this book but if you know how if you know what to look for she does make an appearance when lord peter uh, rejects the advances of uh, Diane de, Mo de Montmory and as well as Pamela Dean. Uh, he goes to keep a lunch date, he said, with a woman who's not pursuing him. That's Harriet Vane. So her presence are f is felt even when she is not mentioned. That's right. And also it highlights the fact that he has no interest in any of these women. This is, this is a part he's playing. I was going to say like God in the book of Esther. <laughs> She's she's there even when she's not there. Uh, yeah, so, so the the um the mystery is ramping up. Lord Peter feels certain now that a murder has been committed, but he doesn't know by whom or for what reason. Uh, and there's just a lot of suspicious things, and he's asking more and more of Diane, like what was the deal with Victor? And she finds out we find out that Todd Mulligan told her to string him along, and then told her to dump him. So the fact that he had some kind of cross with uh, organized crime here and drug dealing certainly, uh, you know, lends a lot of potential danger and suspicion mm -hmm. and trying to find out if these two worlds are connected. The uglier side of criminality is implied without really being depicted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think she's I think she's capable of suggesting a lot. No, I do, too. I, I mean, do. that's the mark of a real artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also we find out they're going to be putting together a cricket game. So that is going to be coming up. We've got the, the office cricket match. This is this is like the American version of the office softball team. I was confused enough already, and then cricket comes into it. No, I know. Perhaps my student who plays cricket will be able to quickly explain it to me before we get to this chapter, because I get confused every time, every time. But we'll talk about that on the role of the cricket game when we get there. Um, anything final you want to say about these chapters? No, no, I'm still, I'm I'm happily confused and um, enjoying myself thoroughly. Well, that's part of the form, right? So we, you know, we, we fall in and we are also in a state of confusion and we also shall be brought to to, to a place of order um, and all things will be revealed. So uh, I'm so glad. It means so much to me that you're enjoying this. I hope you guys at home are also enjoying it and are, are starting to be charmed by all that is Lord Peter. Oh, you know what? I want to say one more thing. I totally forgot this. So... His dream world spill over into the real world when they show up at his house, at his sister's, at his brother's house. His brother is the Duke of Denver because he's the second son. And they crash the party. And uh, for the second- You're right. Yes, that was important. That was important. So the, the nightmare world spilled over into his regular world. Uh, and he, uh, well, he handled it in the same way that he handled it when the advertising girls saw him as Peter and he pretended 
that Peter and Breeden are two different people and Breeden is a cousin. He went so far as to say Breeden's a, a, a drug lord and uh, he impersonates Lord Peter all the time and basically just makes his life a living hell, <laughs> which was fantastic. I just love Lord Peter so much. Like the drug guy's like, you know, I know because there's a there's an actual book. If you're American, this will be shocking to you. But there was a book that had all the members of the aristocracy listed, right? So you couldn't really fake it. There was a there was a book. Um, and so when Todd Mulligan says, well, I've seen the Breed book and um, I, I know you don't have that cousin. And then Lord Peter says, not every puppy in the kennel is listed. It's so uh, good. <laughs> so good. There were a lot of those. Every country had, I mean, Germany had the, uh, the Gotha Almanac. I can't remember what the what the British one is, but yeah, I think th those were um, the almanac of who's important. If we had, yeah, well, we have the who's who in America, right? If we, if we had a book of uh, American aristocracy, you and I would not be on it. It's called People Magazine, I think. Oh, definitely not on that. The twentieth most interesting literary people in the country. Yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be us. It wouldn't be us. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we're going to be right back here next week. With chapters 12 through 16, we'll get a little further into the mystery. And, and I'm very curious how she's, now that I'm looking for this dream world, descent, nightmare world, everyone falling asleep and they need to wake up. I'm quite curious how she's going to pull this all together. Um, any final thoughts, Mr. Banks? No, I have no thoughts. None at all. You've shut down. Pretty much. Game over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time for some opium and some cocaine and some heroin. Yeah, some uppers. Mm, yes, children listening to the Literary Life podcast in no endorse. way endorses the use of opium, cocaine, heroin, any and other all illicit drugs. <laughs> just gin, right? Just, just, just gin. Old school. Uh, so join us back here next week for the next set of chapters, twelve through six, in Dorothy Sayers, one of my top two favorites of hers, "Murder Must Advertise." Until then. Don't forget, go to houseofhumaneletters.com and check out Karita's webinar, How to Read a Symphony. You can also see what's going on on our Patreon. And just a reminder, we are 100% uh, uh, sponsor, uh, listener supported. Uh, we're an ad-free podcast. We do talk about our work at the House of Humane Letters, but we don't accept ads. So we're not breaking up your podcast with another, you know. <laughs> now, wouldn't that be ironic if we actually had ads on a podcast about murder must advertise? Like, <laughs> new track soap, uh, is this podcast hard on your nerves? Take new tracks. Um, but uh, yeah, so we don't do that. But if you're interested in supporting our work or joining the community of our listeners, you can go to patreon.com backslash literary life to find out more about that. Until next time, gang, keep crafting your literary life because stories will save the world. Thank you for listening to the Literary Life Podcast, brought to you by our loyal Patreon sponsors. Visit houseofhumaneletters.com to find Angelina and Thomas and to sign up for our newsletter with podcast schedules and more. And keep up with Cindy at morningtimeformoms.com. Join the conversation at our member-only Patreon forum or our Facebook discussion group. Visit patreon.com backslash the literary life to find out how you can sponsor this podcast and get great bonus content. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, and check out our sister podcasts, The New Mason Jar and The Well Read Poem. And now for a poem read by poet Thomas Banks. Selection from To a Lady on the Characters of Women by Alexander Pope. Flavia's a wit, has too much sense to pray, to toast our wants and wishes is her way, nor asks of God but of her stars to give the mighty blessing while we live to live. Then all for death, that opiate of the soul, Lucretia's dagger, Rosamunda's bowl. Say what can cause such impotence of mind, a spark too fickle or a spouse too kind. Wise wretch, with pleasures too refined to please, with too much spirit to be air at ease, with too much quickness ever to be taught, with too much thinking to have common thought, you purchase pain with all that joy can give and die of nothing but a rage to live. <laughs>